The title of uh, my presentation is Odysseus in Eschylean Drama, Revisiting the Fragments. And we deal with fragments because Odysseus plays no part in the extant plays of Aeschylus, but he is an important figure in several of the poet's fragmentarily preserved works. Uh, Aeschylus composed a tetralogy concerning the most intriguing part uh, of Odysseus' story, which is his nostos, his return home after the sack of Troy. And this tetralogy is highly fragmentary and controversial, and it possibly consists of the tragedies Psychagogy, Penelope, uh, and Ostology, and the Sutter play Circe. Now, the first play of the trilogy, the Psychagogy, which is the Soul Raisers in English, or the Ghost Raisers, uh, tackles the topic of the Homeric and probably also cyclic Nekia and corresponds to Book 11 of the Odyssey, which is uh, the famous trip to the underworld. Uh, Penelope, which comes second, uh, certainly takes place in Ithaca, somewhere inside the king's palace, and deals with the killing of the suitors, which means that it corresponds to Books 20 to 23 of the Odyssey. And finally, the third part, the Ostology, which is the bone gatherers in English, recalls the last book of the Odyssey and the beginning of the Telegony, where the relatives of the murdered suitors arrive at the king's palace and gather the remains of their loved ones. Now, however little the information regarding the trilogy is, it is apparent that Aeschylus draws upon popular Homeric and cyclic episodes in order to compete with the epic world and its dynamics. The poet engages in a dialogue with his archetypes and proceeds to revise them. And unfortunately, the fragmentary nature of the trilogy does not grant us the evidence to understand the full extent of this vision. But what Aeschylus does is he employs various techniques through which he deconstructs the epic hero and presents instead a very different Odysseus from the one the epic traditions have created. And in order to do so, he has to reshape both the characters and the setting of its myth in order to detach them from the glory of the epic world. Uh, time is not enough to go through all three plays, so I will only examine the first one, the Soul Raisers, which is the one that we have the most evidence for. Uh, some of the techniques that Aeschylus employs in this play are the ones you can see uh, on the slide, the reframing of epic episodes against a different background, the marginalization of the epic protagonist, the inversion of the epic prophecy concerning the hero's death, the ironic allusions to the epic text, and the portrayal of positive epic elements in a negative light. Now, I'm sure you all know that Odysseus's most enviable achievement is his journey to the underworld. And in the Odyssey, it is Circe who gives Odysseus very detailed and useful advice, but she's not physically present when the hero travels there. So Odysseus is all alone in a journey to a fearsome unknown place that is uh, literally positioned at the edge of the world, namely the end of the ocean. And then upon successfully following Cersei's advice, Odysseus must interact with the souls of the dead in a state of constant fear of the known and unknown terrors that await him. Now this perilous trip is transformed in the Soul Raisers because the tragic poet reframes it against a different, far less dangerous background. To begin with, the Aeschylean Nekia takes place in a geographically identifiable place, a lake which is either next to the Acheron or the Avernus Oracle of the Dead. The place is not explicitly specified, but it is nonetheless realistic. And thanks to the ancient testimonies, we know that the setting of the play is one of these two historical Nekiomandia, which were definitely known to the Athenian audience. As a result, by transferring the Nekia from its audition undetermined geographical setting to a real-life location, Aeschylus removes the exotic element and significantly lessens the fear of the unknown that Odysseus is faced with. Moreover, in this version of the myth, Odysseus is not alone in his journey. He is accompanied and aided by the members of the chorus, who are professional necromancers that live near the lake, and they give him advice so that he can safely and successfully summon Tiresias. Of course, the fact that the chorus is physically present during this adventure diminishes the danger for Odysseus. Finally, uh, the chorus says that the souls of the dead will travel upwards to meet with Odysseus, and that the water too moves upwards. You can see how 
he, uh, the members of the course, they use the, the verb anini, which means to move upwards. This means that all activities take place on the surface, which is the world of the living. So there is no blurring between the two worlds, as is the case in the epic. So to sum up, Aeschylus places the entrance to the underworld in a real and not a mythical place. He portrays an Odysseus that is not alone, but accompanied by attendants of the oracle, and includes no implication of a catabasis in his play. Now, it is apparent that this change of setting and the subsequent shift in focus result in the marginalization of Odysseus. Aeschylus downplays the hero's contribution during both the journey to the underworld and the killing of the suitors, which happens in Penelope, and that's a story for another time. But as far as the soul raisers is concerned, Aeschylus' choice to surround Odysseus with necromancers deprives him of his traditional role of the leader. These necromancers, they guide him step by step, they give him all the answers, and they tell him everything that he needs to do in order to succeed in his mission. And it is obvious that Aeschylus could have made a very different choice. He could have chosen a chorus of sailors. Even better, he could have chosen a chorus consisting of the nameless souls of the dead. And then Odysseus would have retained his leading part at the expedition. He would have been obligated to use his cunningness, his boldness, whereas now all he does is participate in what is more or less a walk to it. So this specific choice of chorus changes the uncharted mission to a prescribed ritual and leaves no room for bravery and initiative on behalf of Odysseus. Now, moving on to the third technique, which is the inversion of the epic prophecy. And that is actually the most interesting part, because we know that in the epic tradition, the purpose of Odysseus' journey to the underworld is to find Tiresias, the seer who will tell the hero how to proceed in order to return to Ithaca. And at some point during his speech, Tiresias also prophesies Odysseus' death, and he predicts a gentle and peaceful death for the hero that will come at an old age. And as you can see, Tiresias says that death will come to you ex alos, which means far from the sea or from the sea, a death so gentle that will lay you low when you're overcome with sleek old age and your people will dwell in prosperity around you. So Tiresias predicts a death that will come to Odysseus probably in dry land after having escaped from the sea, which is the domain where Poseidon exhibits his wrath. And his death is described by Tiresias as avlichros mala, meaning very gentle. The adjective liparos that is used to describe the hero's old age, his giras, literally means shiny. And in this context, liparos points to an old man that is wealthy and healthy looking. And then Tiresias uh, reassures the king that his people will be olvi, which means that they will be happy and blessed with riches. And that completes the picture of a perfect death, because Odysseus will die having accomplished all his duties, both as a war hero and as a king. And we should also note that he uses the verb pefni, which is from, from the verb thino, a verb that is used in the epic to describe a violent death, usually a death that happens on the battlefield. But that's not all, because we have another account of Odysseus's death, a post-Homeric epic account, the one told by the poet of Telegonu. Uh, in this account, the hero is killed by his son, Telegonus, the son he had had with Circe. Now, this account offers a different interpretation of Exalos, because here his death comes from the sea. Telegonus travels by sea to Ithaca, and then he wounds his father with an arrow whose edge is made by the spine of a stingray, which is a sea creature. So here we see a drastically different ending for Odysseus, a death that cannot be considered either gentle or ideal, but it is nonetheless a somewhat heroic death because Telegonus, albeit unknowingly, engages in a battle with his father, which means that he makes Odysseus die a death that is reserved for the warriors in the Iliad. So here, in the tragic play, Aeschylus makes a very different choice because here too, we have another prophecy concerning the hero's death. And Tiresias speaks to him and he says that a heron in flight, a heron is a bird and a roglios, will strike you from above with its dung, which is the word onthos, when it opens its bowels. And from this, 
the barb of a sea creature, Pondiu Voskimatos, will rot your aged, hairless skin. So we hear that a heron will strike and infect, and infect Odysseus' skin with his excrement that will contain a lethal spine of fish. And obviously, such an ignominious death is certainly in contrast both to the gentle death Tiresias predicts in the Odyssey and the somewhat heroic death Odysseus suffers in the Telegon. Here, Aeschylus describes the king's agonizing decay and awards him an unheroic and undignified death. He focuses on the negative aspects of old age and puts emphasis on the king's demise rather than prosperous longevity. His skin, as you can see, is described as paleon and trichories. Paleon, or you can understand it, is self-explanatory, whereas trichories refers to the shedding of hair, which is a process associated with physical decline and loss of strength. So we see that the good-looking skin of the epic, if you remember the adjective cliparos that we saw before, is here transformed into a rotting one. Odysseus' death will come slowly and probably in an agonizing way, as the verb sipo, to rot, suggests. So the contrast with the verb pefni that we read in Homer is striking, because the epic prophecy describes a death that will at least be quick, whereas the tragic prophecy describes a slow and torturous death. Moreover, the cause of his death is absurd to the point of ridiculous, and we see that his death does not correspond at all to the values of epic poetry. And in fact, his demise is so ludicrous that some scholars considered the soul raises to be the sadder drama of the tetralogy. Because we see here an Odysseus that dies an old, decaying, ordinary man, not by the hand of a brave hero, but because of an infection that is caused by a trivial sea creature. And however troubling this choice might seem, it can be explained if we consider it part of the intertextual dialogue that Aeschylus creates between his poetry and that of his epic predecessors. Now, what Aeschylus does is that he uses epic language in order to describe a reality that opposes the values and the glory of epic. And I will present to you the two most characteristic examples of this technique. He alludes to the epic text through ironic intertextual puns. And here's the first one. Tiresias, as we saw, speaks of a heron, of a bird that will eventually be the cause of Odysseus' death. And the mention of a heron is a very bizarre and puzzling one, but it can be understood as an ironic allusion to the text of the Iliad, and more specifically, Book 10 of the Iliad. Uh, you can see that Odysseus and Diomedes are getting ready to go spy on the Trojans, and then they hear the cry of a heron that flies on the right side. And they interpret its cry as a good omen. And in fact, this heron is sent by Athena to assure the two warriors of the success of their mission. And that's why we read that Odysseus was glad at the omen, Here Odysseus Thor. So Odysseus is glad to hear the heron because the bird is a sign of his upcoming victory. In Aeschylus, the heron, the same bird, signifies the hero's death. And both sent by the god, the epic heron foreshadows the favorable outcome of the dangerous mission, whereas the tragic one, consciously chosen by Aeschylus, marks Odysseus' demise. Now, moving on to the second example, which comes a little later in the, in the Iliad during the funeral games in honor of Patroclus. There, Ajax and Odysseus engage in a speed race, and the race is very close, but Ajax is ahead until Odysseus prays to Athena to help him win. So Athena intervenes and makes Ajax sleep on the filth of the sacrificed bulls. And the word to describe this filth is onthos, the same word that we find in the tragic prophecy. As a result, Odysseus outruns him and wins the race. And when Ajax manages to speak, he acknowledges that Athena caused him to fail because she preferred to help Odysseus. So Odysseus takes a victory that he should not have won by having a god cheat on his behalf. Now, in Aeschylus, a very different onthos causes Odysseus the greatest defeat of his life, which is an undignified and torturous death. So we can see that Aeschylus uses the elements of the hero's epic triumphs against him. 
the heron that was once a herald of victory now becomes the carrier of the poison that will kill him, whereas the filth that once ensured his athletic, his athletic victory now contains the spike that will lead to his final defeat. Now, moving on to your favorite part of the presentation, which is uh, the conclusions. In his trilogy concerning the Odyssean Nostos, Aeschylus deconstructs the epic hero and the world from which he comes. The tragic poet deprives Odysseus of his best epic qualities. All these heroic traits that made him so special in the epic saga, his bravery, his cunningness, his endurance, they are all downgraded and challenged in this tragic trilogy. Aeschylus reshapes both the characters and the setting of the Odyssean saga, and as we saw in the Soul Razors, he reframes the trip to the underworld against a less dangerous background. Then he puts Odysseus in the sidelines by having a chorus of professional necromancers take up the leading part during the perilous quest. He then inverts the epic prophecy concerning Odysseus's death by changing his demise into an unheroic and undignified one, unlike the two epic deaths that we know of. And lastly, he makes ironic allusions to the epic text that both recall and at the same time negate the epic world and convert the epic reality. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Lana and Evan, for your support throughout the fellowship. And I would also like to say that I'm grateful to professors Martin and Sangalis for reading this paper and for giving me insightful advice. Thank you very much. <laughs>